Okay, all right. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, serverless. That was the, the main idea of the talk, but I will also um, put it in the frame of IoT. Um, and then, because this is uh, the, that's what I do at my main job at Nordic Semiconductor, and then um, give a concrete example um, for serverless architecture on AWS. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm born in 1980. Uh, I'm the end of the, the Xenials. Um, I started building websites and had my first business when I was 17. So I've been straight from school, basically working with web technologies and internet. Um, I did an, an, an education on a job that we have in Germany. It's a little bit like uh, Wiedergon, the school here in Norway. Uh, in 2003 and in at some point I got bored and then I, I actually studied computer science in Germany which then allowed me to join Nordic Semiconductor in Trondheim in 17. Um, at Nordic I uh, started to work on our first um, software as a service offering rfcloud.com um, and now I'm working uh, since 2019 at the application group. And our responsibility is to um, yeah, uh, explain our customers how they can connect our devices. That in, in the end, Nordic produces this small chip and creates a lot of tools around this chip. So this is a development kit, but also a lot of software that makes it easier and, and tries to explain to customers yeah, how they can build their own products. And, and products are then something like um, this thingy 91, which is a which is a full-fledged asset tracker. But you might also have seen the micro bit um, that is also uh, featuring one of our chips. And so in, in my team, I'm responsible for everything that's related uh, to cloud um, and, and this is, yeah, where, where kind of my expertise uh, comes from. Um, this is what we're going to go through. Um, it will be a lot. Um, so I absolutely, you will have access to the slides afterwards. Um, there will be a recording. And uh, I'm also happy to, to ask, uh, answer your question if you have afterwards. Or during the uh, talk, please um, use the microphone if you have a question, because I can't see, uh, I don't monitor the, the Teams uh, chat. Um, so let's start with IoT. I heard that you didn't have uh, already an introduction to IoT, so this will be brief, um, but I will talk what's more interesting to me and in our daily work that are then protocols. Um, in general, IoT has been around since the 70s, and, and it means connecting a thing uh, to the internet, internet of things. And this term is extremely broad and, and includes everything where, in general, we say there is not a human involved, meaning um, a machine talks directly to the internet, and it's not a kind of a human reading a sensor value and adding it into Excel, but you have uh, temperature sensor then puts it directly into a database. Um, very often, and this is kind of the standard until today um, for smaller devices, is that you have a gateway. Um, all of you have a thousand euro gateway in your pocket. Um, that's your smartphone. Uh, that's often used for for your Fitbit um, as uh, as a gateway. However, this is very expensive, so. The trend and what we see now is um, that, uh, especially at Nordic, uh, our customers want to connect their devices directly to the internet. So to remove a cost factors in the middle, but also to, to remove hassle when setting it up. Two of my favorite examples that IoT enables, um, which uh, isn't kind of possible wasn't possible before, especially the, the cellular IoT connectivity, um, is uh, these are two examples. One of them, uh, the black box, is mounted on power transmission poles and will monitor if there is a failure on the power line and if uh, will immediately notify it with an exact position where this, where this failure happens. And this will be, um, this product will actually be deployed in California where we had these huge wildfires last year that were caused by electrical 
fires. And if you don't know where a failure is on your power line, your, your resolution for the location is between two large uh, transmission stations, which can be 100 miles. And now they know on each pole uh, if there's a problem. And um, this, this new wave of IoT that we are now seeing enables uh, and it's the first time that makes it possible to have these kinds of products. The other example is uh, a wearable example from construction um, industry. And here, every helmet is equipped with a sensor that detects if there is a fall um, or if there is too much heat or whatever. So if there's something that, that um, yeah, it could be dangerous to a human and will immediately notify everybody around um, using a mesh network, but then will also notify uh, a central system. So um, if an accident happens, immediately everybody around knows um, that something needs attention right away. Uh, and again, technology today gets so small and, and battery powered and, and even sometimes without a battery that we can build in these small sensors in everyday items and that's the idea of, uh, of IoT, making better, faster decisions. Um, there are roughly three categories of protocols that mostly relate to the distance, how you, where you can transmit um, data. Uh, there is ultra short range, um, which is meaning basically you have to touch the device. Um, this is interesting for when you, when you have uh, privacy concerns. Um, NFC is a good example for that. Um, short range is very common. Uh, that's Bluetooth. All the home automation is, is on a short range uh, level where you have range around a few hundred meters at max. Wi-Fi is also a great um, example of that. And we're, what now since like 17 and 18 has become available to the public is this long range uh, for everybody. Um, with the exception that LoRaWAN has been around for years. Um, so long range means that you can actually have kilometer range. And with our devices, uh, we measured on the mobile phone network 16 kilometers of range, um, which is yeah something that you don't get on the other technologies. So that makes it especially interesting for um, applications uh, that, that are not close to, to antennas and move around a lot. Um, we see kind of two, uh, the, the two biggest applications of, of the wireless technologies that we build in our chips is um, asset tracking, stuff that moves around, that can be down to an individual parcel, but it can be a, a, a cat, it can be a dog. Uh, that's a big market actually, uh, pet tracking. Um, bikes, smart bikes, or, or bikes that are that are shared in a city. Um, and then up to that, obviously everything uh, from, from a truck or whatever. Um, and then on the on the other hand, um, all this metering where you where your provider for your utilities, electricity, gas, uh, water wants to have real-time uh, updates of uh, what's getting used. Um, in order to charge it correctly, we noticed from the electric prices in Norway that that can be very interesting to know on a day um, what a consumer is using. Um, but also to support ease of installation, meaning if you can go somewhere and put a sensor on uh, um, an electric meter or on a pipe and then go away and it just works, that means your installation time is super fast and doesn't cost you a lot of money. There are two um, main um, networking standards on the mobile phone network. Um, one is LTM, which is not your kind of super fast 5G LTE that you have, but it's using the same network, um, which is the, the main idea behind it that you as a, if you're building a connected product, you don't have to take care of the infrastructure, the Wi-Fi access points, the LoRaWAN gateways, the customer phones that they need to have with a specific Android version and, and support for Bluetooth, whatever. Um, so the, there has been a standard established that is especially designed for IoT, um, which supports, let's say, sufficient uh, enough bandwidth for 
uh, downloading firmware updates that are kind of bigger, but for the day-to-day -day operation, it's extremely power efficient. Um, it runs on the two gigahertz band. That's um, the advantage there, you have higher bandwidth, but the problem is that it's not good at penetrating ground and, and going into cellars. So um, there has been also, um, an, uh, there's an alternative on the same LTE network that's called NB-IoT. Um, it's called narrow band. Um, it uses uh, typically 800 uh, megahertz um, frequency, which means the bandwidth is lower, but you have better characteristics for penetrating concrete and then going into cellar. So this is very often used for metering where you have a sensor in a cellar that's not moving, um, then this network technology makes sense. The, in comparison, again, what, what we typically see, LTEM um, is very well suited for uh, devices that move around. It supports roaming out of the box. Um, and uh, it's also suitable if you have quite often interaction with the device, meaning sending a lot of data to the device or uh, updating the firmware regularly. NB-IoT, on the other hand, um, extremely power efficient. Uh, can We see customers building devices completely without battery. They are just consuming energy from the environment, for instance, from heat sources, um, collect that into a transistor, um, and then once a day, uh, they send an update to the cloud, um, which is extremely interesting uh, for these um, technologies because we can go towards um, a future where we no longer have batteries on devices and batteries are the one component that lasts uh, the shortest and is the most dangerous, uh, actually, the, the, at least with the current battery technologies. These are these lithium ion polymer batteries. They are um, problematic. They can catch fire if damaged and, and you can just fly them around the country uh, because that's a dangerous good. When we think about um, these devices, now we, we have the connectivity. We also have to talk now about what, what is actually the data. So what, what makes this device actually smart? And that's the data we are sending back and forth. And, and what you see here is a very typical um, uh, scenario or architecture for an, a single IoT device, how it sees the world and how it communicates with the world. Um, the, the orange box, that's, uh, that's our device here. And there is roughly two main, or, or no, there's actually, there's two, typically two um, connectivities um, that these devices use. Uh, one is HTTP for downloading bigger files. Um, we still use classic HTTP um, because it's extremely um, efficient when downloading binary data um, and it supports uh, advanced, um, or not advanced, but it supports, for instance, features like range requests. That means a device can start a download and chunk it up uh, in the, the desired chunk small size and then can resume a download later if it's connected and, and loses connection. So there are a lot of features built in that are extremely relevant for downloading files, even with a poor connection. So it's a, it's a great protocol for that. For the, the data communication, uh, we typically see MQTT. Um, I will talk about other protocols as well, but the, the main idea here is to have a protocol that supports uh, a form of PubSub. Uh, the ability to publish data um, and subscribe to notifications because very often on the device side, I want to be able to react to configuration changes or if my product is actually something that needs to immediately react like a smart lock. Um, if somebody presents the right key card, the lock should immediately uh, be open then I need a protocol that supports these kinds of notifications going from the cloud side back to the device. And um, basically all of them have um, this setup. Uh, you have a, a channel for control data and you have a channel for data. Um, the data, briefly, um, there are these four things that we, we need to um, implement as when we are building a backend for our devices. 
Um, and the, the first one is device state. Um, I mentioned this before, um, the, the smart lock example, this information, is the lock open or is it closed? And uh, you can't, even as a manufacturer of a, if you're the manufacturer of a, of a lock, you can't make a prediction and, and a default setting uh, that applies all the time. Um, because your device will eventually lose power, there will be outages, it will, it, it might get an, an electromagnetic shock that resets the device, you need to uh, firmware update the device. So you need a place that is more reliable to store data than your small physical electrical device. This is where the, the digital twin concept is uh, introduced. And the digital twin is nothing else than a database that stores configuration settings of the device. Um, we also very often put uh, sensor data into the digital twin. Um, if the device is a temperature, uh, as a thermometer, it reports the current temperature to this digital twin. Um, in that scenario, as a thermometer, the device doesn't care like what my current temperature is. It knows it because it's a local state. However, our devices will very often have poor connectivity, be offline, be busy uh, doing other stuff like updating a firmware. So as an application developer, we always want to have a fast access to the last known state of the device. This is again where the digital twin works as kind of a caching layer in between. We can query the digital twin to get the last sensor reading and display it to uh, the end user, use it in our business and have the device eventually send in new data. So we don't have to wait for the device to answer to our request. If we were to do this with hundreds of, of sensors, if you imagine uh, having a warehouse with hundreds of temperature sensors and you want to know the average temperature right now there, or if there's a temperature too high and you would send messages to all of them, you're guaranteed that not all of them will be able to reply because wireless connectivity is, is always spotty in, in, um, to one or the other extent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I talked about device configuration. It's, it's kind of a special subset of, uh, of device state um, in that sense because it's, it's uh, cloud controlled here. Um, it's a general term configuration, but it could mean like which firmware version to apply, um, which parameters for the connectivity that the device should be using, how often it should connect to the cloud. And, and we see, uh, we have this ability now um, and powerful enough uh, devices that we don't need to like hard code every setting, but we can actually um, make the device configurable which is extremely important because um, devices today will uh, be applied in so many different scenarios that as a, as a um, yeah, manufacturer, you can predict the scenario in, in which it will be used and you want to give your customers an easy way to configure it for their region they are in or for the, the, the way they use the product. And, and again, with a smart lock, you can like predict what should be the default value for uh, is, the, is the lock open or closed? It really depends where they put the lock. Um, number three is pass data. Uh, I mentioned this before, um, especially wireless connectivity is not reliable, but you see that with, with wired devices as well. Your internet provider will be down, there will be there are so many reasons why a device might not be able to connect to the cloud and send in the data you're interested in. So we really, really have uh, to, to build in features that allow the device to report um, historical data. And in this example, um, what, I, what you see on, on this uh, screen is a map, <clears throat> is a technics uh, this is a coverage map uh, from Telenor that shows um, the coverage in, in this region. And uh, you can see that coverage on in this valley uh, around the water is very poor and does not exist. And on the ridges and on the mountains, it's obviously very good. So if you would build a sheep tracker or a reindeer tracker, and it would only send position data when it's connected to the cloud, 
you would never find that your reindeer are going down to the valley because there they are not able to send data. But if they make it up to the ridges and, and walk over here, you would see, oh, they're always here in this region. And uh, this would give you completely false data. So you want to still be able to track uh, the GPS location of your reindeers and GPS is actually coming from satellites, meaning you have perfect coverage uh, in the valley. Um, so you need to store current GPS location in the valleys and put it into some form of buffer and send it to the cloud. Um, the, it's a small uh, min minutia uh, in, in difference to regular sensor data, um, but it's important to, to think about this concept that you your device will be sending current data, it will be sending timestamp data from the past, and in our backends, we need to find storage technologies and, and, and systems that allow us to query this data, not when it arrived at the cloud, but when it was measured on the device. And on the device, the implication is that, uh, yeah, you need to actually timestamp data. You can't just send in, my current temperature is five. No, you actually have to say when you measure this temperature. Uh, fourth example or fourth kind of data I mentioned this before firmware updates is kind of this is the, the the most essential thing I'd argue because we know that we can predict the future we can put every feature we we know into a firmware and never update it security leaks uh, security issues happen we need to be able to update firmware and firmware is typically um, much, much larger uh, in size than regular uh, sensor data. So uh, it, it's important to have a dedicated look um, at uh, sending firmware files to devices, how you can optimize this. Um, and and um, that's the, yeah, well, as I mentioned before, um, especially use different protocols that are better suited for that. Now, when talking about data protocols, we very often see JSON. Um, I, we will see this later in the example as well, but I have to mention that JSON is not a great choice for machine-to-machine -machine communication. So the reason for that is that um, we, we see JSON used very often. It's because it's developer-friendly. I mean, it's, uh, it's everybody, every tool we have is able to use JSON by now. Your editor does auto completion, does auto formatting. Um, it's, self, it's a self-describing format. It's extremely flexible. Um, basically, you can put everything in there except references. So um, it's a self-contained format. So there's multitudes of information and, and, and advantages over using it. And all the big cloud providers that, that I've looked at uh, use it as a basis. So AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, their thing a digital twin implementation will actually be a JSON document. And they they will allow you to patch properties in there and send JSON to other parts of their offering. And there you work again with JSON. Um, so it's it's ubiquitous available. So that makes it kind of your default choice to use it. However, um, there, there's a lot of overhead in there. If we, for instance, compare this uh, this message on the left hand side, it's uh, it's a GPS location message, meaning I have the latitude and longitude in there. Um, ACC is the accuracy. How accurate is the the measurement of this location? Alt is altitude, um, and SPD is a speed, a current ground speed. Heading is the direction in which the device is moving. So these are the six values that you typically get from a GNSS receiver. And uh, the, the last the TS is the timestamp in, uh, in milliseconds, uh, Unix timestamp. So we know when this measurement was created. But the overhead is actually all the red things in there. All the, uh, the, the keys, V, LNG, LAT, ACC, ALT, this is for a human. A machine doesn't need that. If I remove um, all this meta information um, and uh, compress it using, for instance, protocol buffers, I can save 65 bytes uh, to that message. And this is 42%, meaning I have an overhead of 42%. Um, and this overhead exists just for a human. So 
um, because the device knows what data is sending. Like it can just take the values and chunk them together and send them over the wire. The cloud also knows what it's receiving because, hey, this is a GPS receiver. So the only, like this overhead we purely add for, for developers and during development, it makes sense. But in production, when you deploy your devices to, to thousands and thousands and thousands of times, then 42% data overhead will really add up. Um, there are two kind of common ways to, to optimize um, what's transferred over the wire. It's actually coming from uh, networking and browser technologies, um, uh, mostly pioneered by Google, but um, we can uh, also uh, use it uh, in, in our uh, embedded operating systems. Um, so there's protocol buffers. Um, we have flat buffers, uh, which does roughly the same. Um, both uh, protocol buffers and flat buffers are not self-describing. So you have to set up on both ends, on both receiving and the sending end, the schema and say, okay, I'm going to send you this message and it has these five values. And then the receiving end knows, okay, the first value that you're sending me is latitude, the second one is longitude. That can be a bit of a hassle to set it up in a project. So one alternative is uh, CBOR, which is taking the same JSON principles, um, having a self-describing schema, but uh, being a little bit smarter and, and allowing to compress and use a binary notation in there. And we see here is again the example using CBOR. Um, it's not as efficient as uh, using uh, a schema less data format like protobuf. And when I say schema less, you have to define a schema, but the message itself doesn't contain the schema. Um, the CBOR message uh, still contains, um, you can map it back to JSON without any additional information. So this information, the, the keys, LNG, LAT are contained in the CBOR message, but you still save um, 24%. Uh, so depending on um, how often your schema changes or what kind of um, project you're building, how, how capable your users and customers and developers are to, to yeah, exchange schemas, then SIBO might be a good alternative. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> as a summary, uh, we have... Um, Important reminder here, if you see JSON, then think, okay, this is for me as a human, but if I'm going to an embedded device, if I'm going to production, think about the overhead. Um, I also mentioned the, the, the protocols before uh, in, in the initial uh, screen that was uh, MQTT uh, mentioned. Um, this is, again, MQTT is kind of the most common one. It has been around for not that long, but it has become <clears throat> yeah, very widely adopted um, for uh, all kinds of uh, yeah, pop up communications um, in, 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 in IoT scenarios or with, multi with setups that use devices in home automation. So you see that very often because it's a nice standard. Uh, well-defined, it supports notifications, it supports uh, multicast, so you can address a lot of devices at the same time. Um, it's extremely flexible. However, especially this combination with uh, TLS, uh, Transport Layer Security, which gives you end-to-end -end encryption, creates a pretty big overhead. So for just for the TLS handshake, you have 10 kilobytes of data getting exchanged between the two endpoints. and if your sensor data is uh, whatever we saw it at 80 bytes, um, that's ex that this overhead is extreme. To be clear, you don't have the TLS handshake for every sending of the sensor data, um, and uh, you can maintain a, a TLS uh, session and connection for a long time, but a lot of devices lose their connection a lot uh, if they are traveling, if they're moving around for bad connectivity, so this becomes a factor that we see. So when, when we talk um, connectivity and, and protocols, we also need to look at the transport layer in the end and find alternatives for transport and application data. And there are two alternatives just as an outlook. 
um, that are worth looking into um, is uh, using DTLS, um, which removes the need for TCP and runs on UDP. Um, MQTT SN is also um, kind of uh, reduces the, the header overhead a bit of MQTT. Um, DTLS is important um, because you can then can run your uh, traffic on UDP. And there are, uh, for uh, cellular networks, there are actually some countries which don't support TCP. Uh, very famous, uh, known, uh, or I don't know if it's known, um, but uh, China is uh, an IoT market that, that basically purely supports UDP. They don't support TCP. And that means your TLS doesn't work. So uh, if you want end-to-end -end encrypted uh, connectivity in a market like this, uh, Germany is another example where um, NB IoT and UDP is the predominant uh, technology, then you need to, to look into DTLS. Um, what we also see is uh, CoAP and LWM2M. Uh, these are two very important protocols uh, for the IoT. They are dated but very established. CoAP, especially uh, in device management from, from telcos, they have years and years experience of managing uh, remote devices. And this is where uh, CoAP um, came out of it. And there is a kind of an, a standard on top of that, that's LWM2M, which tries to give um, a standard dictionary of operations and, and sensor descriptions to allow interoperability, which will be extremely relevant in the future uh, if you start to build products that you want to work uh, with any network uh, and, and IoT interoperability is uh, still in, in its infancy, but LWM term is one of the, uh, the standards where they're trying to, to, to solve that. Um, as a summary, uh, again, there is not, if I say, well, there's MQTT and HTTP, this is not uh, the, the right answer because it really depends on what product you're building, what scenario you're working in. So again, kind of, it depends. And this is unfortunately uh, in, in when you're building an IoT and connected device that's out there in the field, it makes your parameters so much more and it makes it so much uh, more important that when we are working with uh, in these projects and talking to customers that we really look at data, we look at how is the device used in the field, we make sure that we get constantly input about how the device is getting used to, to learn over years. And it's a year long process to, to uh, build uh, and continue improving a product um, that we learn what is the best technologies and keep an eye out for what's, what's available there as well. So um, questions to the connectivity part, because now I'm gonna switch over to serverless. Nope, okay. All right, um, serverless. Um, and now, so, so we're going towards IoT serverless, and in order to understand um, why serverless is so relevant for IoT, we have to kind of look a little bit into what is serverless. Um, serverless is, uh, as Martin Fowler here put it, so this is not my my analysis. Uh, he he, uh, there's a link in the in the notes for. Um, the presentation where it's a long analysis of what serverless is, but I really like what, what they wrote in, in the introduction that it's an, it's an architecture or application design that uses managed ephemeral containers um, and runs on a function as a service platform. What that means, we're gonna go into detail, but the main thing is here managed. Uh, I don't need to think in individual computers anymore. I deploy a function and the function runs, I get a result and the platform takes care of the execution of that function. The benefits are um, 
in, in that sense that I don't need to take care of the whole uh, infrastructure part. I don't need to, to order a metal box that I need to put in a rack, in a rack that I need to um, put into a data center where I need to pay the data center to be there. Um, and then I need to know how many racks do I have? How many machines do I have? Um, this all goes away. Like I, and the, the idea there is that this is computation becomes a commodity, meaning um, I can focus on the business value of my solution and write the code that actually is specific to the product or the domain that I'm building, but I don't care where it's run, how it's run, what the metal box looks like that it's running. I want that it's executed and that it's executed reliably. And this is kind of for me when, when I started working with serverless. So uh, that was roughly in, in 12, 13, when I started to go into this whole uh, cloud business with AWS. Um, and I started to use the first serverless products. Um, this became so uh, obvious to me, at least, how convenient it is that I don't have to take care of the machines. Um, and I can, yeah, focus on uh, the, the solving the problem that my customers have. And I have specialists that are that enjoy actually looking after the machines, going to the data centers, swapping out hard drives and whatever, taking care of about security um, and uh, do their business. And it's no longer my problem. Um, that allows me, yeah, to, to rely on a giant like Amazon or Google or Microsoft to provide me the resources. They basically never go down, they're always available. So um, I can do a lot of things uh, now in, in, in the same time because I can focus on developing the solution and I can go on vacation. Uh, that's one of the, in, in my experience, a really important aspect um, of having the ability to go serverless uh, is that, yeah, I, I basically, if it runs and there's no mistake in the, in the programming, then it will run, it will scale, it won't crash. <clears throat> so um, the one important thing there is that not everybody can go serverless because serverless in the end is um, uh, locking you in into a specific vendor. It is using technologies that is not open source, um, which might for some kinds of products not be allowed. Sometimes you are forced by law or because of legal requirements or because of data privacy concerns to run your own infrastructure. Um, then uh, the, the, the serverless approach in that sense is still not that easy. Um, again, because there's no um, open source, very, very few open source equivalents of that that are proven, um, that makes it harder to go serverless. <clears throat> but let's look, um, if you can, then it's kind of really amazing. Um, one thing that serverless gives you, uh, they've automated um, because they need, uh, it provides you a, a way to execute arbitrary code. So the serverless provider, Amazon, Google, whatever, they don't actually know what you're running. So the contract between your code and them is basically, hey, uh, here's some inputs and here's some code, let's run this. Meaning they have found a way to generalize this and automate the provisioning of the resources that I need to run code, which the upside of that is that they can do it over and over again. And this means it's easy for them to scale up and provide me more resources. Um, that means if I write code that runs, allows you to, to, to compute in parallel and where I can divide up operations in parallel, I get uh, scalability for free. However, uh, again, um, I mentioned this here, you have to deal with eventual consistency. And this means if you start splitting up your computation into parallel executions, you suddenly have this problem 
that your data is also distributed and not everything is kind of atomically uh, uh, in one place anymore. And that requires you to really change and, and be cautious about how you develop your solution and um, change the way also you implement, for instance, user facing features. Another important huge aspect for me is that we go away from this monolithic software deployments where we have one huge Java jar file that we deploy on an Apache Tomcat. And if I want to make a change, I need to deploy a new jar file. And that means I need to reboot the, the application server um, because everything is just one big instance. Um, I now have divided up my application in hundreds of individual functions that I can individually update, meaning I no longer have kind of this maintenance window where I need to tell my customers, hey, I'm gonna reboot the machine on Saturday night at three um, because there's the few people that are using it. I can deploy micro updates over the course of the entire day. And if I break, if, if the update is actually problematic and creates a bug, then it's very likely that it will only affect this small function. Even if that function crashes, not the entire application service will crash. Um, it only this function will crash and a small component of my, my solution might be affected, not the entire solution. There are downsides, <clears throat> however, um, that are important to, to mention. Um, there, I have an entire talk on, on testing serverless um, that is the, the the, the, the high-level summary of that is that um, it becomes an extremely challenging uh, task now to test serverless solution, especially because when we write um, testable uh, code and, and we, we, we write our tests, we typically assume that we can run everything on our machine. We, we can run the software on our machine. We have our database, our Postgres, MongoDB on our machine. Uh, we have the, the web server on our machine, Node.js, Apache, whatever. So everything is kind of on our machine. So we can interact, we can mock it, we can inspect it, we can trace it. That all goes away with serverless. In serverless, they're like, I don't, I don't, I can't even download a binary for, uh, for the IoT hub. I can download a binary for Amazon's web server. They, there's this proprietary technology that is not designed to run on one single machine, but it's always a combination of multiple uh, machines that are load balancers, that are like database servers that do sharding, um, that are uh, message buses in between to provide a serverless service. So there is no way to actually run it on my machine, meaning I have to start uh, developing new, um, yeah, new ways to actually make sure that what I'm like trying to do and, and what I'm building is actually correct. So that's a huge, it's not a huge downside, but it's a, it's a huge mindset shift. Uh, and and uh, a lot of the techniques that you know for testing software don't apply anymore to serverless. Uh, Infrastructure now becomes part of your solution. And, and I said, well, I don't need to take care about infrastructure before. Yes, I, correct. I don't need to think about in metal boxes and racks and, and connectivity and RAM and hard disk size, but still I need to tell Amazon, hey, uh, I'm gonna run this code and I need this amount of RAM and I need uh, network connectivity and it should be able to talk to this database and." Again, I need to describe this database. Oh, I need a table here with these fields and these indexes. So suddenly, uh, you no longer can, can send an email to your IT admin and say, oh, I need a Postgres database. Please set it up for me. But you, as a developer, have to take care of that. And I think this is um, that's actually an upside because then your infrastructure becomes explicit. It's not like, OK, there's a MongoDB listening on this port, but okay, there's a storage for data that I can query. And this is uh, described in a way that your cloud can set it up for you. 
there's no human more involved anymore. So you need to express everything you need in, in terms of your resources to your cloud provider, um, which I think makes for a much completer project documentation. Um, but yeah, it, it, it increases the, the learning, the, 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 the way to be productive and the, the onboarding time immensely to first need to understand everything that you need and might be needing. And there is a lot of uh, potential for making mistakes um, and picking the wrong configuration and then you have to start over again. However, the cloud is, uh, is really uh, has a lot of patience. So if you make an error, it's only your time. You're not annoying a colleague. Uh, so yeah, again, upsides there as well. I mentioned this before. Uh, serverless is usually closed source, um, especially when, when you run on cloud providers uh, and then pick a serverless solution, they don't give you the solution. Uh, Amazon has DynamoDB, which is kind of the oldest serverless service they have. Um, there is a DynamoDB local, which in the end is not DynamoDB. It's a wrapper uh, with a comp compatible API um, that allows you to talk to the service that's running locally the same way you would on the cloud. However, it doesn't behave that way. Um, it runs on your machine, it doesn't scale, it doesn't have the, uh, you can't just dump a petabyte of data in there. Um, so it's, it looks the same, but it's not the same. And uh, for, this is one of the now over 200 services that, that Amazon offers, not all of them are serverless, but for there's kind of only this one <laughs> which you can run locally. Um, so this is um, <clears throat> this is a big point to consider. Um, there is uh, this argument of vendor lock-in, meaning that if you pick a serverless technology, you're bound to um, the uh, yeah the, the domain of, of this vendor. But we're gonna see later that. When you only your concern is basically authoring JavaScript code or, or the the contents of the function you're running, your business logic is still uh, to some extent transferable and not depending on on the cloud provider. And in reality, there are I haven't seen like a, a multi-cloud approach uh, where you have to kind of run the same functions at the same time on different cloud providers and. If you're one of the few companies who has to do this, like if you're a bank, uh, if you're required by for by risk uh, to do that, then you typically have enough money to just copy the code and have the logic in two places. So that is then then cheaper than having true cloud uh, cloud independence. Um, yeah, the the mindset shift is actually the one I think that's the biggest one when you go into serverless because you have to leave everything behind that you might have learned about running a web server, running your local instances, um, doing uh, networking, orchestration of services and, and storage and whatever. And you start uh, also having to split up your application from monolith to, to small so-called microservices um, which is an entire different uh, topic to have uh, about software architecture. Um, and that that makes it, uh, yeah, the, one of the biggest challenges, I think. So I, I mentioned AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud before, but uh, I work mostly and, and enjoy most uh, AWS. I'd say that um, arguably AWS is uh, the most advanced when it comes to serverless offerings because they are the one cloud provider that um, has, I think, the most experience uh, productizing their own infrastructure. Um, Azure, Microsoft uh, is kind of late to the game. And they, in my experience, I've, I've worked now for two years with Azure as well, doing the same things I do on AWS. They are uh, more... Um, uh, oriented towards still containerized solutions. So serverless is not such a great experience there. Um, Google Cloud has been around also for ages. Uh, it's called App Engine, what they have. However, uh, the developer experience on Google is at least to my, uh, to my liking, not as great. And Google has kind of a more introverted view of what works. So they, they will give you something that works for them where 
uh, and it's hard to talk to them. There's very little communication going on between uh, like companies like us and, and Google, where we have a very good relationship with, with AWS. So they are extremely open and listening to, to feedback. And that I think that shows in, in their products. So I think uh, AWS Lambda is probably the, the, the most advanced and robust implementation of a serverless function uh, as a service platform. And we're gonna look a little bit in how this works. Um, here's the hello world for a Lambda function. This is all the code you need in order to, to get it executed. What this code um, does uh, is a listing um, the, the buckets on S3. S S3 is a <clears throat> blob storage uh, where you can store any binary data under a path. You could think of it as a file system, um, but it's, uh, it's also a serverless service, meaning you have the ability to create a file there and then retrieve it later. And this, I, I think this is, uh, this is pretty amazing because what, what this code or this execution already gives us for free is um, we don't need to take care of dependencies. They are already there um, because I'm using uh, Node.js here. Um, I get the AWS uh, JavaScript SDK for free. It's just there. Uh, I don't need to take care of getting it up there. <clears throat> I can instantiate a connection to a service, uh, encrypt it, and with the correct credentials, because again, it's in the environment. So somehow uh, serverless and, and Lambda takes care of that for me as well. No passwords, no connection strings to a database, nothing. It's just, it just works. Um, I don't need to take care of where to route my events from uh, in, in, a, in a function. I can um, blissfully wait for the event to arrive and the infrastructure around it takes care of routing the event to me. Um, and then I return pure data. So you, you might see here that I am returning a promise. Uh, promise is an asynchronous uh, function that eventually will return a response. Um, and this response will be the, the list of buckets, which is a list of objects. Um, and I don't need to serialize it. I don't need to put a content type there, depending on my integration. If it's an HTTP integration, um, again, Lambda will take care of that for me. So I kind of, it completely removes a lot of boilerplate code I have in, in typical uh, functions, and I can focus on the business logic here. It's, it's a very simplified example, um, but this can be uh, uh, also list your users in your application if you want to show, if you're building a chat application, for example, if you want to list the rooms or the users, you really focus on, I need to, the components, the dependencies I need to talk to the services, instantiate them, return the response, and then I'm done. And that's, I, I think, uh, amazing to be able to focus on that. I can do this uh, in a lot of languages um, out of the box. Uh, AWS Lambda supports uh, Node.js, Python, Ruby, Java, Go, and .NET Core um, out of the box, meaning that they have a predefined execution environments that you can just use. Um, but you, if you need something else, uh, then you can build your own custom runtimes. The only like requirement is that it runs on Amazon Linux, which is kind of a stripped down Linux distribution, but that's open source and the you can build your container with the runtime requirements you have for your language um, there, and then it will run your Lambda functions. I have in the in the notes, I have links to uh, all of the, the documentation for this as well. <clears throat> so um, there's uh, one caveat, uh, runtime is flexible, but there are limitations to Lambda. So uh, generally um, we want to use and can use Lambda if, we, our execution time for one operation is less than 15 minutes. I'd say 15 minutes is uh, extremely long. And typically what I see and I've done in the past is either very short, meaning a few seconds, um, and the situation that I had where I had execution times that are very long, 
um, that doesn't happen very often. But for instance, if you were to process and compress data, or if you have uh, like need to migrate databases, for instance, you need to go through a billion of records and transform it into a new format because your schema changed and you need to run some updates. There are obviously always in a project situations where you have to uh, run for a longer time. And then we come to this mindset shift problem again, you need to find a solution. How can you chunk up your work into smaller uh, yeah, <laughs> sets of work that can run within this 50 limit, uh, 15 minute limit? And this is a hard limit. So for a lot of the limitations on, on AWS, you can call the support and say, hey, I need more. I need more storage. I need more whatever. Um, but the execution limit is there for a reason because uh, what Lambda takes care for you is infrastructure and they don't want to like have uh, functions there running forever because they can't guarantee this actually the way the, the service is designed. There are other limits, um, maximum 10 gigabytes of RAM, uh, the payload, the, the incoming event itself uh, is limited uh, in its size. Um, <clears throat> however, stuff like this can be circumvented if you, for instance, have a large data that you want to process like a video um, or a big photo, you would then store it on uh, S3, for instance, put it there on a file storage and then load it in the Lambda. So it's just the invocation, the information that's contained in the invocation can't be larger than that. That becomes mostly relevant if you uh, start sending, for instance, um, HTTP post data to a REST API to, a, to an API gateway and contain a huge file upload. That won't work with Lambda, so you have to connect it, uh, your REST endpoint to a three directly. Um, yeah, the, the source code itself uh, is limited in size. Uh, we come to the, the reason for that later. Also the number of open files you can have. Um, I mostly, uh, in my career using serverless, I have the, the 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 two things I have actually encountered is the payload size and uh, source code size. That can be challenging. Source code size, especially with JavaScript, with a lot of dependencies, um, and uh, that's where you have to invest a lot of time. And payload size, yeah, it's not untypical to have file uploads which are like whatever, ten megabytes or twenty megabytes. Uh, if you had take a photo on your uh, on your smartphone today, that can easily be twenty megabytes. So that's something to, to consider and work around. But the reasons for these limitations is actually how like Lambda scales for you and, and how they provide environments for you. Um, what they, they want uh, and what they, so what they want is basically you should have short running functions so you can process many events at the same time. <clears throat> However, if you have longer running functions, um, they will start spinning up more instances uh, of your function for you. Um, and uh, it will basically follow the demand. This is configurable. It's in the end also a question of your budget. Um, if you give uh, unlimited scaling capabilities and you have a lot of requests, um, that it will cost you obviously more money. So. Um, you at some point will start looking into, okay, what is a, um, what should be maximum values for scaling? That means if there's somebody creating a lot of requests, you might at some point cap it. But in practice, um, the uh, Lambda has an auto scaling feature, which scales the number of available functions that can handle requests um, uh, very, I'd say, conservatively, meaning they don't uh, go up very fast. They follow the request pattern pretty good um, and they they downscale quickly. So um, you're really, and this is one of the main amazing features of serverless is in this chart, you can see that you're, you're paying for what you're using. You're not paying for a server idling around sitting in a rack doing nothing but consuming electricity, using uh, up the runtime on your hard disk drive, burning through the 
connectivity on the chips, if you don't use it, and if you have no requests on a Lambda function, it will scale down to zero, meaning there will be zero costs. And Lambda is a service where you actually, you don't pay for the time around your execution, you pay for the runtime. So every, every 200, I think now it's 125 milliseconds execution time, you pay for that. That's a resolution. If you're not executing code, you're not paying. <clears throat> One important aspect uh, I think we have to, to, to think about is um, how Lambda isolates functions. The, we, 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 I said before, you, we're going away from this monolith where everything runs in, in an Apache Tomcat in one big instance in your Apache. Um, uh, be, and we want that so we can spin up multiple um, mini containers for each function. Um, I will uh, it, uh, quickly later also talk about that. Um, but the main thing to know is that each function is isolated on itself. And I'm not a infrastructure guy, so there's a lot to, to learn and, and research about how this can be done in a way that it's secure, because in the end, what AWS does is they divide up resources on, we still today have physical computers, um, so uh, there needs to be a way to divide up the resources we have there to run executions from different customers on the same machine. And this always is a big security risk because you're running arbitrary code. AWS is running code that I'm giving them. And there is today, there is no good way to detect if I'm sending them uh, code that contains an exploit that tries to on that machine to, uh, for instance, figure out where uh, data from other customers is stored. So they, they are, have invested a lot uh, and they open sourced actually their solution called uh, Firecracker that allows them to create these sandboxes around small functions and do this in an efficient way. Um, so what you, the important thing here is to remember that if you run a function, it runs on somebody else's machine and you're sharing this machine with another customer, but the platform, the function as a service platform takes care of isolating your code and your request and your data from another request from a different customer. And um, on, on your function level, you, you really can't see other functions. So there's you might have used uh, kind of a message bus uh, in, in the past um, or atomic global variables that all the different uh, um, yeah, functions in your Java uh, environment can talk to like a global counter that they can change. This all goes away. This no longer exists, um, which I think is beautiful because my code is dying all the time. So I really need to build in this robustness that I have no local state. I, I only have state as either in a database or it's not there. And um, so I, I really, uh, again, coming back to the mindset shift, uh, it's a different way of looking at uh, how to process data, but it's um, really, really useful for a lot of scenarios uh, where very often um, uh, codes can, can have bugs, uh, it can die, I need scalability. And I only get the scalability if I can isolate my functions because if I scale with shared memory, that means I need to scale this memory as well. And this is, is physically limited to what is possible on that machine. I can't scale RAM to a different machine, but if I have all my functions in small, uh, in small slices, that I can scale to many machines. And that's the main reasons why we're doing this serverless stuff. However, with scaling um, comes, uh, yeah, the problem that I need to start the function. And this is an important aspect we need to uh, talk about when, when thinking about serverless is that 
in a classical application server scenario, you starting your application server and then it's there. It's idling around, it's waiting for requests and it can kind of, it knows how to route requests and which code parts to call. Um, in serverless, every time a function is started, there is uh, a phase where the function is not ready. So um, these functions, the services, um, since they don't charge me, when I'm not handling a request in my code, they also throw away my code. Um, and that means if a new request comes in and the function is not ready because they're using the resources to process other customers, um, then they will, uh, then I will see this cold start uh, phase where <clears throat> the, the platform takes a while um, to prepare my function. Uh, in, in Lambda specifically, it means it will download the code from S3 downloading. That's why the, the package size is also limited. They want to limit the time and the amount of data they need to pull down from uh, their, their storage, even though it's internal. Nevertheless, it's important that it doesn't become too big. So they download the code, um, they spin up one of their micro VMs, um, and then they take the event and feed it into the VM and process the output. Um, once the uh, once the function is running, it will stay around for a while. And Amazon doesn't give you a guarantee of how long that is. It could be that after they've proce processed your event, that they immediately kill uh, this function again. And there are many reasons for that. Um, one could be there's a lot of requests right now. There could also be a security update. Uh, they could be decommissioning this one machine it's running on and then switching over to another. So there's so many factors that they just say, nope, we don't give you any guarantee about how long your function will be active. Uh, and uh, so you might face this, uh, this cold start time in between all the time. And this is <clears throat> one of the, the more common reasons why you will be facing a cold start is if you change um, the, uh, the actual code of your function if you deploy a new version, then Lambda knows, okay, like there's a newer version, I can't reuse the existing one that I have, I have to throw it away and create a new one. This very happens very often uh, in, in, uh, in, during development, but it doesn't really happen that often in, uh, in production. Um, we, let's have a, another look at a little bit at, um, at these code start scenarios to, to explain a little bit better in more in production requests. Um, what we see here is basically it's a uh, Monday morning, everybody comes into the office, logs into Teams, and suddenly you have a lot of, lot of, lot of locking requests. And because the weekend happened, nothing was going on, all the lambdas went down, no requests were made, and suddenly you have six or a lot of requests at the same time. And um, because you want scalability. You don't want to like ideally want to handle them as fast as possible. Lambda will spin up six instances of your function in parallel and all of them will hit the cold start penalty and then be able to process um, the requests uh, in time. Um, and this will be faster than just queuing them up and waiting until it's available and then processing it. Um, but if a Lambda function is, for instance, uh, active in, in that scenario, we see that there are coming in requests, uh, they're trickling in a little bit. Um, we have the, the first call start and it handles the first event and a little bit later comes another event. If that event happens while a function is already active, Lambda will spin up a second instance to handle the second event but then keeps the first uh, Lambda function active. If there's a new event, it will then start uh, load balancing basically the events between the active functions. Um, and this is, that's the typical scenario that you have in an app. Um, you reach a certain level of activity and uh, Lambda keeps enough functions uh, for you available um, to process all the requests uh, swiftly, uh, as fast as possible, but it doesn't keep too much around. However, again, it depends on your scenario. Sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you 
don't want to process a million events at the same time because you have time to do it in a synchronous way. So you can save some money there. Um, and here's an example where we are processing data from an S3 bucket that could be your trends uh, forming photos that are on that bucket and somebody like uploads 5,000 photos there, but your service says, well, we have time, like we don't guarantee you that all of them are transformed immediately. We can do it in, in a few minutes. So you start processing one by one. <clears throat> and this is where you can also limit concurrency and say, well, my Lambda function should only process one event at a time. And then uh, it won't spin up additional instances. This is a scenario where, um, yeah, you get, can limit the, the amount of uh, also money that Lambda in the end costs. Um, because we saw in the picture earlier here that Lambda will overshoot. It, because there is a delay between the start and the handling of the events, Lambda will, uh, in the beginning of the, in front of the curve, overshoot the resources. It will kind of predict, try to predict okay, I'm seeing an uptake uh, about 10%, so let's create 10 new instances. And um, if you're getting hammered with events, that overshoot can become very expensive because you're paying for then uh, the, uh, these, um, these events being uh, handled. Um, and uh, there's also a limit uh, in what can be, sorry, uh, yes. And there's also a limit in how many functions you can have at the same time running. So you also want to limit that as well. Um, cold start um, is, I'm talking a lot about it because it's significant. What we typically want in Lambda function is response times in the milliseconds, like maybe 10, 50 milliseconds response time. Uh, cold start is, like a hundred times that. Um, we're seeing these are, uh, somebody did uh, measure cold start times. Um, the, 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 the smaller, darker area is I think the 95th percentile. Um, so we are talking still 250 milliseconds. That's, that's 10 times. And depending on uh, what you're using and what your uh, typical response time is, uh, it can be like, magnitudes higher. So um, it doesn't happen often, but it's something that we need to consider and, and understand why it's happening. And there is reasons um, or there, there are reasons why cold stars take a long time. So there are ways to, to mitigate that and to start optimizing. And I think the, the most important one is um, a uh, reduce your uh, the size of your code, uh, the deployment artifact, because the more code you have there, the longer it takes to boot. Um, and yeah, pick kind of a lean execution environment. So Java compared to uh, to Node.js is a little bit larger. Um, Python is extract uh, is very lean in that sense. Um, so have a look at the technology you're using. And then also have, especially have a look at not only the code, but what you're doing before you can actually start executing code. And that could be creating a connection to a database instance in the back um, before the function. That uh, is also important. And in the end, um, the less time you spend in that function, the more you can process, then the quicker you can process the next event. So also uh, keep in mind if you're doing operations in the Lambda that might not be necessary or uh, not efficient. So now we're gonna merge these two topics. Are there questions for serverless? Okay. Mm. IoT loves serverless. Uh, oops, sorry. There, there, there are reasons for that. And um, we, I call that the snow world scenario. If you're thinking about a massive multiplayer online game, um, like hundreds of players are on the same instance or even thousands of players need to see the same 
uh, world state, they, they need to share it. They need to be on the same instance too. Like if somebody shoots, if player A shoots player B, the 99 other players need to see that it's happening. Um, so there are architectures and, and, and software products which need, absolutely need this real time synchronization of all the events. We don't have this in IoT. Like all the IoT devices are basically isolated uh, producers of data. They don't see each other. They just send in data to the cloud. Um, there is there is a very little need to to share state across many devices. It's very happens in very few scenarios. And B, because of the nature of IoT with pure connectivity, uh, devices losing power, needing to go to sleep, consume energy all the time, we don't have this real time. Uh, experience that we needed. So it's it's perfect application and, and serverless can be used there for, uh, yeah, just perfectly. I can scale this very well. Um, scaling is the next biggest issue. We are talking 18 billion IoT devices this year. And uh, you can, if you start Googling for how many devices there will be, um, there are, it's an insane amount of of devices that will be connecting to your solution. And um, I see that from our customers, it's really impossible to predict if you're gonna be successful or not today. That means if you are charged with building a backend for an IoT product, so you're building the next uh, cap tracker using uh, our chips. And if you're lucky, you're getting featured in TechCrunch and you have an awesome feature or whatever happens, your devices get bought a lot, you suddenly are facing um, easily increase of hundreds of thousands of devices every day sending in data into your infrastructure. And their serverless is just perfect because it just scales just in a sense, if you did all the, the work to, to, to use its features in uh, before, um, it scales with you and all you have to have is a big credit card. And this is no joke. Um, if you don't take care of uh, cost management, uh, this will like bite you. But on the other hand, you are able to serve all your customers. And it's like losing a customer because your service, your website does not work is way more expensive than paying for handling their data. And then within a few days, figuring out, okay, which parts of my solution are actually too expensive? Where can I um, shave off some costs? Um, so that's what serverless gives you. It gives you this buffer to, to scale and then kind of work on a solution. If you have fixed machines in your data center, there is a hard limit, which at some point they will reach it and they will no longer serve requests. I, what I also see is that um, data IoT, what we mentioned before, it feeds into a lot of uh, new applications like sending alerts, um, uh, informing users about uh, and businesses about what's going on. Um, and this, this means there's so many different ways I can want to process this data, um, what I want to do with it. And this, this is, is Lambda again, a great application because I can write very small functions that work only on a subset of the data that's going in. I can focus on changing that and it allows bigger teams to work independently um, without affecting each other. And it, and it supports kind of a, a development um, model where uh, yeah, we work closely uh, and solution oriented and not have to think too much about, okay, if I'm adding this function, how does it fit into my big uh, infrastructure and, and how does it play well into my existing Java infrastructure? Um, I don't, I can have two lambdas that do the same thing in different languages. I can pick Python for one feature, I can pick Node.js for the other, another feature, I can have Go for the third feature, and all of them run into my same account and work with the same data. So I can pick the right tool for the right, uh, for, the, for, the, for the scenario I'm working on. And this is an extreme flexibility, which is really beneficial when, when working in, uh, with a product where we don't know where it's going. Will it be successful? We need to learn a lot about it. What can we make with the data? Our customers are really only learning very often what they can do with the data once it actually arrives. 
So and now coming to the final uh, part where uh, we're gonna look at a real world example. Um, real world example means this is actually open source code. Um, it, uh, it, the, the, the high level example is, I'm gonna, I want to visualize temperature on a web application. So um, on this web application, um, there is a, uh, this is a React app uh, that, that fetches data from uh, a time series database and shows it on a chart uh, over time. Um, and that's my goal. Yeah? As a user, I want to know what's going on in my warehouse. Um, and I have this device, which has a temperature sensor and sends it into the cloud. So um, I'm gonna, in a minute, open up this mirror board where we can walk through it. But uh, what we're gonna have a look at is, um, this is the architecture diagram for only this feature. Um, and um, you can do more with that, but we're gonna look at the, the flow of the data from the device um, to the web application and which AWS components are involved. And the, the AWS components are at the bottom, these orange uh, items, uh, icons, and all of them have uh, a link in Miro to the actual documentation um, in the AWS docs. Um, so you can kind of reference, okay, what am I using here? What's the component that's in there? And um, there's also a link to the actual source code in our open source repository, so you can see how it's uh, implemented. And you, we will see very quickly that uh, your solution, if you're using serverless, there's no server, there's no IP in there, but a lot of the code then becomes uh, actually describing the relationship between the components. And this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, uh, infrastructure is now your business as a developer and uh, infrastructure means writing connectivity and writing glue code between these components. And this is also when I say testing now becomes uh, more challenging because you now also, in, when you write a test for your solution, you need to figure out a way to test this glue code that you're writing. So let's have a look at that board. And I think, okay, Miro refused to connect. Let's see, there it is. Okay, I have to change the screen share, I think. Let's see. Okay, so you should be able to see a mirror board, right? Can anybody confirm? Yes. All right, thank you. So um, let's start. I have. Where are my friends? Oh. Yeah, friends. So again, um, let's start from the beginning. This is our kind of scenario that we want to implement. I, as a operator of a cooling warehouse, I want to know the temperature in my warehouses. So I have a device. Um, that's sending temperature data to the cloud and I somehow need to show it on a web application. Um, and we're gonna now look at the actual AWS components that are necessary to get this done. Um, I like to go by the, the data flow because I think this is, um, uh, that makes a little bit, uh, at least I hope it makes it understandable to follow. So. What we have um, in, in here in the first place is a device that's connected uh, to, that's connected to AWS IoT core um, using TLS and QTT and sending JSON data. 
uh, AWS IoT Core is um, their IoT offering. It's yeah, it's an MQTT endpoint where devices can publish data um, to topics, but it has also a rules engine. And this will be relevant for us uh, here. Um, the device is configured to send an adjacent object to uh, its shadow, meaning it will um, send an MQTT message that arrives here and uh, AWS doesn't know what this data is. So th they have no concept of my product here because it's for them, they just give me MQTT and say, you can send in data. We will store this for you. But everything we do with this data needs to be expressed in an IoT rule. So an IoT rule is um, uh, a way to describe what should happen if a message um, arrives. Uh, in, in source code, it looks like this. Um, so uh, this project you will see here, um, that's open source. And what I'm using here is the AWS CDK. It's a cloud development kit, which um, is, a, is a, a typed layer on top of CloudFormation. CloudFormation, and we have a link here as well, I think. Uh, no, I haven't linked the CloudFormation constructs, but CloudFormation is, um, we can search for it on this IoT CloudFormation, is a JAML or JSON syntax to express um, resources on AWS. It's a, everything you can like click together in the UI in the console on AWS can be expressed using CloudFormation. And um, this is a descriptive language that tells AWS, hey, I want to have this feature with these properties. And then AWS CloudFormation will take care of providing this for you. So what, what we're doing here is that um, we're writing a rule that takes incoming messages from this topic and this is, uh, this is a predefined topic from AWS for uh, the digital twin. Um, and we're gonna take all the messages that are here and we're forwarding this to a Lambda function. So this is our rule that uh, allows, um, will take care of that this temperature event is forwarded to this Lambda function. So, um, here we see uh, our first uh, and uh, serverless feed. Well, um, actually, IoT Core is also serverless. Um, there is no, uh, I don't need to set it up even. It's not that I have to say I want uh, AWS Core in my code. It just exists in my account. All AWS accounts have one instance of AWS IoT Core. And the, the thing you as a developer need to do is to describe, okay, what happens if a message arrives at IoT Core? Um, the, the Lambda function uh, then handles this message. Um, here's the, the cloud formation um, definition of the Lambda function. It defines where it can write to. So we want to write uh, the records into uh, TimeStream. TimeStream is a database uh, of, uh, from Amazon that is uh, suited for time series data. I mean, you have a timestamp and then some payload and it is great for having stuff that you want to query by time. So it's ideally uh, suited for IoT. Um, and uh, we configure this function to be able to write into TimeStream. This function then writes into TimeStream. Um, TimeStream again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, this is all I need to tell Amazon, hey, I want a TimeStream database. Um, TimeStream has not much that I can configure. Uh, it's a schema-less database. So what, what I'm configuring here is how it uh, retains data. It distinguishes between in-memory data and then data stored on magnetic storage, on physical storage, that's only configures how much data in the past I can 
I can access. Uh, that's always also related to costs, but this is everything. And then I get a database where I can write into. So um, that's all, all in a sense. I, I need to know already about uh, these features um, to, to be able to write, uh, store my, my data, but um, scalability is basically unlimited. AWS IoT Core scales to billions of devices. That's what they guarantee. My Lambda, um, since it processes each message individually, can scale horizontally. Um, Timestream, again, scalability is not my concern. It will be able to uh, accept all the messages I'm sending it. And there's that blue arrow is basically this connection between uh, this Lambda and this time stream that includes a queue. Uh, this queue meaning if the Lambda sends in too much data to time stream or if time stream service goes down for maintenance, AWS will take care of queuing up the remaining messages and then guarantee me that eventually they will be ending up in time stream. Um, I don't need to take care of that. I can just rely on it happening. However, now on the user side, um, that we see this, this we, we will encounter this eventual consistency problem since I have no guarantee here. So there's no contract between me and AWS or between these two services that says every message that arrives here and that I send to this database needs to show up and be queryable within 100 milliseconds. It's just not there. So um, when I'm building web applications and, and user uh, facing products or services that rely on this data, I have to understand this implication. And uh, for this scenario, it's really, is not a big of an issue if that last dot here um, uh, on the chart gets updated uh, immediately or in a few minutes, um, I just know it will happen. Um, but if you were building, for instance, alerting services here about uh, if the temperature, if there's a fire, then this architecture uh, might not be uh, ideal. And you might want to have something that guarantees you a more immediate availability of that temperature reading. But if now, if we're the user and we are locked into the web application, uh, here again comes the, the problem of serverless is that my user that's using the web app talks directly to my database. And this is mind boggling for people uh, who are known to build an application service in between. There needs to be a REST API, there needs to be a GraphQL API, there needs to be an app server here that protects the database. In serverless, I, I expose the database is wrong because this database is already on the internet. AWS puts this thing on the internet, it's there already and is available for querying via HTTPS. What I, when uh, writing this um, infrastructure, need to take care of is actually setting up the correct permissions. So um, using AWS Cognito, which is arguably one of the most complex services on AWS, I need to configure uh, a way for users to authenticate using username or password or OAuth. And um, this will provide the locked in user with credentials for a role. And I think this is the most interesting part. In this role, I say, if a user is locked in um, using the identity pool that I've configured, um, then assign them these permissions. And we will have a, what's the time stream? I think that's at some other place. Um, so I, I need to define what this user is able to, uh, to access in, in my account. Um, and then AWS will take care of that. If a request comes in here, it will be checked against the role. Uh, it will also be checked against, here's the permission for time stream, um, that this user can actually access my table and select data on there. And if that's true, then, data will be returned to the client. If not, it won't happen. And the beauty here is that I have to express everything explicitly. Like there's no default permission for AWS uh, Cognito, but if I do it, um, then I have 
uh, clarity in my code what each user can do and which resources they can access. And uh, this is very often missing in, um, in standard setups where functions can access everything that's exposed by the database and you can suddenly, any component can query your database from, from anywhere. Um, in, in a serverless uh, setup, um, I have to make this explicit. So let's have a look. Oh yeah, time's up. Let's share this one. And I'm done with that. Um, there are two book recommendations. I think they're not related uh, to serverless and IoT uh, specifically, but I think they're very two very important uh, books to consider when building resilient architecture. In the end, that's what we're doing with serverless. And Accelerate is more kind of management and, and delivery, continuous delivery focused book about building better products and how to do it as a team. I think two are very important. Um, yeah, final slide. Uh, really looking forward to feedback. Um, I'm, I'm be here if there are questions, but I know we are short on time. Um, you can always reach me uh, on email, via email or on Twitter. Um, the slides uh, and all the links uh, are on bit.ly slash AWS IoT arc. Um, yeah, and if you want to work with stuff like this and tackle the problems like this, then have a look at our jobs. We're actually now starting to hire summer students for this summer and have jobs for graduates as well. So thanks for listening and uh, I'm opening for questions.